so we were talking about big telescopes. So now we're going to talk about bigger telescopes. The goal for bigger and bigger telescopes goes back a long way. Uh, astronomers for a long time had been you know, realizing you need bigger telescopes to see things, but a lot of the European astronomers were fairly content with the telescopes that they had and making the discoveries that they were making. Uh, it was really the Americans, in particular George Ellery Hale, that was really pushing really big telescopes. And that set the stage for even bigger telescopes. Uh, and so even bigger telescopes were built. And the Americans started ending up leading with the telescopes, particularly the, uh, 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 the, the, uh, when they got around to the Palomar Telescope. Mount Palomar telescope, and then eventually uh, the Russians, you know, the Soviet Union wanted to do something, something even bigger, but their telescope didn't really work quite as well as, as the Palomar telescope. So even though their telescope was slightly larger, uh, most astronomers still regarded the telescope of Mount Palomar to be the premier instrument. In fact, Palomar is still a spectacular instrument. Um, but the problem is they wanted something bigger. And they were reaching the limit as to how big a telescope could get, um, at least with the technology at the time. And so they started thinking about it and said, well, the, the problem is that we've got this telescope and the light from the mirror is focusing all up uh, to another mirror and then directed somewhere. And so they got to wondering, would it be possible to use multiple mirrors focusing light all to the same spot. And so uh, what would you call such a thing? Well, in the typical way astronomers name a telescope with multiple mirrors, we name things very boringly, okay? It's called the multiple mirror telescope. And so here we have six mirrors that all focus light all to the same spot in the middle. And so this telescope was built as a test bed uh, it wasn't, wasn't the final product. It was the test bed to indicate you know, that this technology would actually work. It, and um, it did. Now, the multiple mirror telescope had various issues with it. But it did prove that this basic idea that multiple mirrors could be focused together would work. Now, you could tilt the telescope, and then if, if the temperature changed and it expanded, or if gravity sagged on it, or something happened to make it go out of focus a little bit, then you can fix that. And so uh, by adjusting each of these little mirrors slightly. Well, that eventually morphed into the Keck telescope. Uh, this is in, at uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And uh, there's two of these identical Keck telescopes. We call them Keck 1 and Keck 2. And each one of them is made up of a mirror. And the mirror, each one of these segments of the mirror, is a separate, independently adjusted uh, piece of of polished uh, material, uh, actually gl aluminite glass. But each one of them is, is, is adjustable. So what you do is you point the telescope up into space. There's a laser that fires up here and causes a little fluorescing spot in the upper atmosphere. And you point the telescope at that spot. And then each of these mirrors can be slightly adjusted to bring the entire thing into a proper parabolic shape. And so now you, you can focus it and by adjusting the mirror. And so now you can build much bigger telescopes. In fact, each of these mirrors is itself about seven or eight feet across. So this is a huge instrument right here. And, and so that's the Keck telescope in Hawaii. Um, well, not to be outdone, they realized you could do even better. Okay. Uh, the problem was going bigger because the Keck telescope, Keck 1 and Keck 2, were amazingly expensive. And so um, an interesting thing happened, and that is in Texas, uh, we got money, uh, University of Chicago and Texas together, uh, 
uh, got money to build a telescope. It's called the Hobby Eberly Telescope after Bill Hobby, uh, Lieutenant Governor of Texas, helped to get it. And the way that it works is it points in one direction in space. Instead of pointing in all different directions, you know, the way that, that other telescopes do, it points up in one direction. You can turn in azimuth, but it's always fixed in altitude. It's always the same angle. And so you have to kind of wait until what you want to look at is that angle. Well, it's not quite that bad because what happens is the mirror down here is not 100, is, is, is not a really perfect parabola. It's more of a spherical mirror. So what you do is you can move the detector along this path up here. So when the detector is at the bottom, then light reflects off of this part of the mirror, so from this part of the sky and up here. When you move the detector up near the top, then light reflects off of that part from up in this angle. And so even though the telescope only points at one angle, by moving the detector back and forth, you can sweep across the sky. And so this is a way cheaper way of doing it. And so the Hobby Eberly telescope, even though the mirror is actually bigger than the Keck telescope mirror, then what happens is you end up with a much less expensive uh, thing. Uh, uh, similar to the CAC, you have this tower up here that fires a laser beam up into space and you focus on it. Okay, the, It's located at McDonald Observatory, McDonald Observatory in far west Texas. Uh, it's operated by the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, uh, even though th this is out near Fort Davis, uh, it's the closest town. Uh, so it's middle of nowhere, West Texas, uh, uh, Fort Davis, Marfa, Alpine, those are the closest towns to it. Um, the interesting story here is that uh, McDonald was a wealthy uh, person wanting to donate money um, to build uh, uh, an observatory. And he donated to the University of Texas. Well, at the time, University of Texas didn't even have any astronomers. So they had to, had to hire astronomers and build uh, an astronomy department. And so they built it out in the middle of nowhere. And the, uh, the uh, rather the Hobby Eberly Telescope is located there. Well, it's not the only thing there. That's the Hobby Eberly Telescope on that right there. Uh, this is actually a photograph from a trip to the uh, uh, a field trip out out to that area. Um, and so that was the original McDonald Observatory. Uh, originally, it was just that one telescope up there was the first telescope, and then they built a bigger one, and and then several smaller ones up there. And so that was the McDonald Observatory at Mount. Uh, 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 Mount Locke. Uh, Mount Locke is pretty much full, so when they built another telescope, they had to build it on the adjacent mountain, and, and sort of in the saddle between the two is a visitor center. So you can actually go out there, and the visitor center has exhibits, and you can get to take a tour up to the bigger telescopes up there. And uh, at night, uh, uh, they occasionally have star parties at the visitor center in the middle there. Okay. Uh, this is actually the astronomy club here uh, that had many, many years ago gone out there, and, and that's uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Keck Dome, right? Uh, not the Keck Dome, but the Hobbit Eberly Dome right here. And again, it's made up of segmented mirrors in there, and this is the, the mirrors being installed, so it gives you an idea as to how big they are. Not to be outdone, uh, since, the Keck uh, since the Hobbit Eberly is only in the Northern Hemisphere, they wanted something similar in the Southern Hemisphere. And so in South Africa, they got the money to build this thing that's called the South African Large Telescope. And so it's, it's basically a duplicate of the Hobby Eberly Telescope. Uh, the design was so successful, they built another one in the Southern Hemisphere to look at Southern Hemisphere objects. Now, both the South African Large Telescope, or SALT for short, and the Hobby Eberly Telescope Rather than taking photographs, they are almost entirely devoted to spectroscopic studies of stars and nebulae and other sort of uh, things. Uh, you learn a lot more from the spectrum than you do just from a photograph. And so modern, modern astronomical telescopes you often use spectrometers and other sort of detectors uh, rather than just photos. Um, at one point, the Hale Telescope, because they named the, the telescope at Mount Palomar after uh, George Ellery Hale, was the largest telescope on Earth, 200 inches across. That's five meters. But the uh, um, large, uh, rather the BAT-6, 
that was the one that Russia built. Uh, so 1948 was when the Hale telescope was completed. Uh, Russia finished that in, in 1976. Since then, a large number of telescopes have been built that are, in fact, uh, larger than the big eye in, in, at Palomar. Okay. Uh, the CAC telescopes are in here. Since then, they built something larger, the Grand uh, uh, Canary Telescope, South African Large, and Hobby Ebola Telescope. Now, some books do not put them above the CAC because you don't use the entire mirror at once. So some books actually put them under the CAC uh, in terms of sizes, and some of them put them at the top. Uh, the Large Binocular Telescope uh, on Mount Graham in Arizona is actually two smaller telescopes that put the light together. So it acts like a telescope of 11.8 meters, but each one of them is 8.4 meters across. So again, some books put it up near the top and some don't. There's another telescope being constructed that's right in, 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 in this area right here and it's about to come online. Okay. So... While the Keck or the Hale telescope was the largest telescope on Earth, you know, from 1948 to 1976, uh, and when I started school, it was the big biggest telescope. Um, it's now the 19th biggest telescope. There's 18 telescopes bigger. The key to all of that was the ability to build these segmented mirrors, so you don't have just one big mirror right there. The other thing that we worry about with telescopes is where to put your telescope. So you have the spectacular telescope, where do you want to put it? Um, one of the problems you remember from atmospheric windows is infrared light makes it almost to the ground, but not all the way. And so uh, since you want to be able to use infrared light, you often would use these telescopes on the top of mountains. First of all, on top of a mountain, the you have less atmospheric disturbance. There's just less air you're looking through. The air is thinner, and so that makes for clear, clearer viewing. And some of the infrared makes it down here, and, and a lot more of it makes it here than makes it all the way to, all the way to sea level. And so you can use the near infrared to expand the range of wavelength you're looking at. Uh, so that previous was Cerro Tololo, that was actually a Amer uh, uh, National Science Foundation, so, so North American Observatory. It was in Chile, okay, to get the southern skies. In North America, we have the Kitt Peak National Observatory, which is located uh, 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 um, um, near Tucson. Uh, where we have the McMath uh, Solar Telescope. So you would have a telescope, uh, mirror up here, catch a sunlight, directs it down to an observing facility on the ground down there. Uh, the Mauna Kea Observatory, uh, in which we have multiple telescopes here. It's an international organization. The Mauna Kea uh, Observatory is, is, you know, is, is, is obviously American because it's in Hawaii, but you have other countries that are putting things here because the sky is absolutely pristine and clear. It's one of the best places on Earth to build a telescope. Um, and it's cold up there. The air is so thin, even though it's in Hawaii, it's cold. Yes, this is snow down here. You don't normally think of Hawaii as having snow. So if you're on your way to Hawaii and somebody, you know, uh, you know on the airplane is carrying a parka with them, then he or she may be going to uh, the uh, top of the mountain here, to the observatory. Uh, there are other telescopes that are here. Uh, J Japan actually has a telescope they call the Subaru Telescope located here. And it is a coup de focus. So the light comes in, bounces up here, comes down here, then comes out the side. So the entire telescope pivots. But this area where the instruments are doesn't move. And so that way you can have uh, several thousand pound instruments.